Anyway, Good afternoon and welcome to UNITAP webinar. Yep. This will be a, a live forum. We are recording. And we just want to acknowledge for a start that we, we get it, that everyone is working perhaps from somewhat challenging circumstances. It might be a home office, might be an office in the garage, wherever it is, you might be doing some, some days on, some days off, whatever. So thank you for sparing the, the time, investing the time to come onto this SKIN webinar. We do invite you to and encourage you to, to ask questions. There will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, and there have been some, there's some interesting entities on board from mega mining to oil and gas major contractors. Um, really the whole point of this, this session this afternoon is that space around making corrosion simple, making corrosion control simple. Now that's that's a big it's a big ask it's a big thing to say it's a big bold statement but what we have gotten the feedback is that the the skin process is it does make it so much simpler so that proactive preservation is a space of making your life just that much simpler. We're going to cover it just on a, a high level. We know we, we won't exactly go into nth degree detail but again there might be a specific question that you have from from your site and we encourage you to, to chat that in or to ask it verbally and share it with the team. Um, but what we'll start off with is just a, a quick intro video of, of the product and that space around skin and making corrosion control simple. Thank you, crack on. So just before we track on with, with this next one, I just would like to say some of you on the call today will be knowledgeable of the name Seal and Peel. You might even remember the name Omnitough. What is now Skin is the new brand. You might say we have reskinned the look and, and that is what was known as Seal and Peel. There has been some very encouraging, very exciting developments in this space and so what is skin is what you might have known as seal and peel. But what you can see now is, is a question, what's the status? And that's something that we find at Unitough Global. We, we, we ask the customer, what is the status? Where do we need to go? You know, what is the pain point? Because oftentimes it can be, as we, as we know in these mega projects, it can be a small, you might say seemingly small cause that has huge effects. Um, so what we're going to do, I guess we're going to we're going to drill down. We all know planet Earth. We can see the big continent of North America there, and we're going to you might say take it from a thirty thousand foot snapshot or, or zoom in, and we're going to we're going to we're going to move through. We're going to zoom down to where you are and build up from there. So we're zooming in. We can start seeing the Gulf of Mexico and. I believe this might be a bit of a, an aerial view of Sabine Pass in Louisiana. So we we come in closer and we starting to see some context. There's a what looks like a piping yard or lay down yard. And then we go even closer and then we start seeing you might say that oh, moment where we see that that rust that has made ingress again. We can see some protective coating that has dripped some and we all know the pain that this is. It's the, the pain is huge. We, we've, I'm not telling anyone on this call anything you don't already know. It's it's a real challenge when you've got those serrations and there's pitting. There's you might say there's issues. There's rework and the cost of rework, as you know, is not just about the cost of refacing a flange or a shaft or whatever it is. It can be a, a huge manual handling task to get that back to a machine shop. Remachined and then back to site. So 
the pain is high, the stakes are high. What are we going to do about it? So really, where do we need to get to? Where where is excellence? What is world best best practice? And really, what we're presenting today is simple corrosion control. And in the skin range, what we have fed back from from team members like yourselves, and I realize um, the team members calling in today are largely supervisors, managers, superintendents. So you've got teams under you, but the three, you might say, what's in it for me is it's easy to dry, easy to apply rather, and fast drying. It is incredible ability to prevent rust creep. So you might say where the coating is, the rust is not, and then it's non-residue. We just had a feedback from one of the um, Navy contractors where they actually sent it to their lab for testing. And the, you might say, testing for the residue, and it was extremely exciting feedback you know there was a, it was you might say a negative it was a non a non present so extremely good non residue and quick cleanup time so you might say banana skin peelability so what we're going to do now is we're going to actually share with you screen to screen we're not we're, we're sorry we're not with you at your site personally but um, we found these live demos extremely positive so we're going to we're going to track through with a live demo what I will do is I'm just going to show you um, very quickly a sample where we can actually peel. So this is just a little, you might say, two by two, two inch by two inch square, and it's been coated. And I'm going to peel this back. You can see the shiny, and you can see where the where the non shiny. So what we're saying is the actual coating, where the coating is, the rust is not, and there is further further sharing, which we'll show in a salt water test where we take it out after a month and peel it back and you've got your shiny metal surface. So William and Tim, are you are, are you on? Can you share screen? Yeah, we're on. Yes, Gary. we are, Gary. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to do a test. We're going to actually do a, a demo and we're going to use the aerosol for a start. Um, so I'll just do a quick talk through on the aerosol. This is really where the, um, you might say the technology has taken a whole new level. It's taken some years to get this right. It's taken many countries to be involved as far as raw materials of nozzles and spray and actuators. But to get a coating as thick as skin effectively coming through an aerosol has been, it's been a, a work of art on the number, a number of specialist part. So the first coat, and I'll just, give you a quick talk through and then we'll see the guys actually doing it. It's about that bed coat, it's that tech coat. And for us, for, for UNITAF, it's, we see it as important to get that, you might say coverage right, so, so cover it. Focus on getting it covered. And then the second and third coat, if that is what is required, that's when you do your build. That's when you actually focus on building the coating. So you've got that, again, banana skin that you can peel back. The beauty of it, as I, as I said earlier on, it's quick drying. So you can essentially coat virtually immediately on top. You know, two to three minutes, it's touch dry. So you can virtually do your, sub, your subsequent coats immediately. So thank you, Tim and William. Please track on. So you can see it, it, it is a, a blue product. That's one of the new developments too. It was silver. We've actually upgraded it so that the skin 45, which is for the, the mild steel and the carbon and the aluminum is, is a blue. And then the skin 20, which is the um, stainless and alloys is actually, being, you'll see that migrating over to a green product. What we've also found is that some of the feedback from, from some of the EPCs that have used it over the years, whether that's in brush form or aerosol, and perhaps particularly in brush form, it's been very effective to do the first coat, you might say, in a circumferential direction, and then the second coat in a, you might say, in the direction of the radius, so a radial direction. So you have a, a, almost a cross weave of coating. 
that minimizes the likelihood of any pinholes or, or you know penetration or leaving out any gaps. So thank you for that brief demo there. Now what we have you can see is a pre-coated flange and we're going to peel that. So you can see a shiny metal surface. Thank you for that. So now what we'd like to do is we're going to do a further peel, which is, sorry, a further coating, which is on the, the one gallon tin. So we've got another flange there, Tim, if we can just do a, a quick demo on the, the brush version. So we know this is not exactly typically the flange you're going to use because you're going to have a bolt, you might say your bolt face, and then you're going to have your raised, your raised gasket face. But from, from a demo perspective, it'll just give you a quick idea of what can be done. Now, one of the things that we also get feedback is that the coating, because of its viscosity, it is able to bridge holes. So sometimes if there is a, a small gap, it might be a whatever, a transition, you can actually use the product to, to transition or to actually bridge over a hole. Thank you, Tim and William. Tim and the job for us. <laughs> That's fine. That's good. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, William. Appreciate the um, appreciate the input. So what we have now. Thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you, Tim. So we're going to move on. There's a, a brief video showing a salt water immersion test, which we'll just get up on the screen and share with the team. This is just a, a quick video clip which tells a story of a month of salt water immersion and then taking it out and peeling it. Thank you. Steve, we can't hear anything. Can you hear? Yep, I can hear you now. Oh, just reshare. So I was just speaking to one of the attendees today. Scott, thank you for sharing some of your, your comments. But this was a, a case study which we were very involved in, Curtis Island. This is in Australia, where there was, I think it was something like three mega projects all done simultaneously. So it was a massive construction 
well, mega, mega site with mega projects all involved. And the, the cost of rework that we saw was, was absolutely phenomenal. The, the, you know, there was lay down, and you would, you would all know this, lay down yard upon lay down yard where there was piping modules, and pumps and valves, and you might say everything has got flanges at least. You might say two on every two on every item, and the cost of remachining and manual handling of these huge components back to machine shops in certain cases where they had to be remachined because the preservation coatings that were used that had been used offshore, whether that was Malaysia, China, wherever it might have been, Bataan, when it got to Australia, and again it had to sit in those harsh conditions, which should be no different than what you've got Gulf of Mexico and and other parts. East Coast, wherever it might be, Canada. Um, the the cost was. I mean, we we estimated. We didn't get exact numbers, but we estimated twenty two thousand plus. So in excess of twenty two thousand flanges, and that that potential rework cost again, we we estimated would have been in excess of ten million dollars. So what we've what we found on subsequent projects when we got spec'd in the cost that it saved was again it was millions of dollars by proactively preserving so by proactively applying it back at the, the machine shop back at the fabrication yard back at that mod yard which before it actually even goes in the backs of ships saved and would have saved in this case it was not saved because it was at a remedial you might say level that we were brought in but in subsequent jobs the, the, the cost, the, the, the investment of proactive preservation was phenomenal. This was just a recent um, Navy, naval industry on, um, contractor that we got a, a written testimonial back from. I'll, I'll let you read it, but I'll read it out to you as well. We were pleasantly surprised to see our grit blasted steel test coupons protect with Unitaf skin for three months outside exposure. Having the coating easily removed and reveal clean white metal with no detection of residual residue looks very promising for future use. So that was a from a you might say a different industry than oil and gas. I know we've got a few different industries on the webinar today, um, but this is certainly a ex very exposed condition as you guys are in in that marine environment. So very positive feedback. So. What we'd like to just do now is open the floor. There might be questions you might prefer to chat that in. You might uh, like to unmute and ask a question so that anyone is free to, to hear the question and answer. Any questions at this stage? Hi, Gary. It's Liz. Hello, Liz. How are you doing? Just fine. Just fine. Um, I had a couple questions I wrote down while watching the presentation and I Thank might you. have asked before when we've met before but just to remind myself um, what kind of surface prep do you recommend now I can understand um, you know applying it to grit blasted steel maybe in preparation for a longer term coating right um, but if it's just sort of basic protection do you need to have grit blasted steel or is it just do you just have to clean? What What do you recommend? Right. Yeah, that, that is a really great question. And and the answer is no, you do not have to have a grit blasted surface to make, you know, to ensure the adhesion. Absolutely, it is done on machined metal surface. So you might say a totally smooth metal surface. It can be done on a serrated surface. It could be on a, a grit blasted surface. From a layman's term perspective answer, basically the mantra is how that surface needs to be upon peeling is how it needs to be when you actually apply the skin coating. Um, so I think we, we have a, a technical specification document where I think it speaks about a SSPC SP1, which is basically just clean that down, remove any of the, the dust, the oil. You might say remove any residue that is there. If there is coating, if there is oil, if there is, obviously if there is dust or if there's rust, we strongly recommend that that is removed prior to the coating. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? That's a really good question though. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I'm wondering is uh, if you are applying it to grit blasted steel, I guess like the Navy was here, 
Yes. Um, it, and I know I've asked this before, and I'm not sure if I remember. I got a clear clip. Clear answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, no, I don't no, want to no, you know, say you weren't giving me clear, clear answers. But <laughs> so when you peel, when you peel off the coating, is it ready to go? As far as is there any more surface prep necessary? If I wanted to put, you know, like an immersion coating on there that's going to last 20 years. Yeah, that, that is. That is um, do I need to do again, do an SP1, but not worry about grit bla re reblasting, or uh, yeah. can I just go to coating? Yeah, that that is a, that is a great question, and I, I think sometimes it might be on a case by case basis. The answer to that question, Liz, mm -hmm. sometimes. I would say typically you would not have to do any further blasting is what I would, that would be my, my first answer. Um, certainly if there was any, I know sometimes certain sites would have just grabbed a, like a citrus based cleaner and just done a, a quick once over. Um, again, there could be a specific reason why they, you choose to do another preparatory, even for instance, the coating that you are going to apply, they might have a specific specification to say, hey, be, on that machine surface, you need to do this to etch it or whatever. So there might be another process. But mm -hmm. let's say in a simple answer, and Scott, I'm not sure, Scott Tramble, if you'd be um, free to make any comment there. I think from a, um, from some of the experience that, that you guys had, it would have been done virtually immediate into installation. What would you say, Scott? Are you happy to share any comment? Yes, actually, uh, I think it's very close to what you were um, saying that, you know, for our case, after removal, it was in preparation for it to be installed. And I guess the, the best way to summarize it is to say that we didn't do anything extra than what we would have otherwise done if we had not been using uh, the product. Certainly, um, like a you know a little a little wipe down just to make sure there's nothing there, but that's what we would have done otherwise. So in general, I would say we didn't do anything beyond what we normally would have to do or was required to do, just because mm -hmm. we used the product. I mean, that is what in the I'm thinking is is you know I blast and then I I get all the dust off and then I coat right so. Um, that would be, I, I would blast, I would get all the dust off, and then I would coat with this peelable coating. But then once I peel it off, um, I, I don't know if you've ever done FTIR or anything to see if there's anything residual on the surface of that steel. Yeah. Um, no, no, that's that's really good. And Liz, we, we're certainly following up. Two comments there. It's good, good feedback. And Scott, thank you for your comment there too. Yeah, thanks um, guys. I mean to interrupt you. Sorry. No, 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 no. no, it's, no, good. no problem. it's great. It's it's so good when you have the live forum because we, we always learn so much from the attendees. Um Liz, what I would say is we we are following with interest and supporting, as you know, the, the lab test that, that you're going to be doing or your lab tests are going to do when you can so that just to make sure it, it meets that that level of 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 what you're requiring technique. Um, I know from the the Navy space, you know, their, their residue, they, that was a laboratory test that they did, which came back within their specifications or required specifications. So I guess it's, it's somewhat hard to say exactly, give a blanket answer, but certainly um, what Scott says is it's minute that the non-residue coding, it's, it's minimal cleanup, if any. Mm -hmm. so, so just a wipe down or something like right. that should do it. Um, so, so typically an SS, so an SSPC SP1, I think would typically right. cover it, right? Right, I and mean, that's what we do before blasting too. So yeah, and yeah. I guess just and, and actually we have a gun, we have an FTIR gun in um, the office, so that's something we could check on after after testing. That'd be fantastic. Um, That'd be fantastic. Yeah, though we won't be blasting the coupons. That's the thing, because you're creating, you know, you're creating yeah. that uh, surface, which would be a little different from just the Q panels that I have. Right. I but, guess yeah. the only proviso I'd say is, you know, just dependent upon what that next step is. So if it is a 20 year, what is their prep work? You know, that would be that. It's in intense. That space, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's but intense. but let's say in a in a broad brush answer, which is not always the right way to do it, but it is 
classically, you know, it, it saves huge amount of time in that cost of rework, the cost of just, just the rust ingress. I know one of the sites I, I visited years ago, they would say sometimes we'll just apply one quick, even thin coat because the time it saves because of the prevention of spot rusting is huge. So yeah. every, every site is somewhat different. I, I admit that. Yeah. And, and then I had one more question, probably a really quick answer, sure. is PPE. I noticed the guys had gloves on, but I couldn't see their faces or, you know. Um, yep. yep, that's a really, really great question. So, again, again, gloves, I guess that is very much driven by site requirement. You know, some require, some sites, I was just doing some training yesterday with, with a, another site, and we were they were sharing screen because that we were training them how to do certain process and there were no gloves used at all now it's not as though you have to use gloves it's that was just i guess just to comply with whatever level of safety is required so gloves are not mandatory from an sds perspective um, as far as any ventilation or respiratory gear it is covered in the in the sds mm -hmm. oftentimes from a lay down yard perspective a lot of the sites will be doing this process in an open environment. And let's say, again, um, from a practical perspective, a lot of them wouldn't have had any respiratory gear on. If it is a closed environment, it, you know, again, follow the SDS. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, our, you, our, our HSE folks tend to be very strict. So even if you are outside, they treat yeah. it like you're inside. So, yes. Yeah. Yes, no, that that is good. I'm yeah. certainly happy to to um, take. I'll, we will note that down, team. If you can just note that down, we'll go back to Liz and make sure that that's covered off. You might say in detail to comply with the requirements. Thank you, Liz. That's great. Great input. Appreciate it very much. Okay. Thank you. There's a question from uh, David Patrick, which Rick has partly answered already. But please repeat the product number for the carbon steel and stainless steel, and do both come in the spray form. Thank you. That's great. Great question, Dave. Thank you for that question. So, um, the, the answer is the Skin 45 is the product that's formulated for the carbon and mild steel, and I'm going to use the word and most aluminums. And Skin 45 is in the one gallon bucket and in the aerosol. The Skin 20 is the, the product that has been formulated specifically um, for the stainless steel and certain alloys. And at this stage, it is on the market or on our shelf just as a one gallon bucket. So that is has not been aerosolized yet. Dave, does that answer your question? Do you have any further specific questions there? No, that was it. I appreciate you answering that. That's great, and and I guess I'll say watch the space. The um, it's it's been a very it's a really good question you ask because actually we started the process of the aerosol. Now I mean the, the aerosol goes back years, but to the more recent iterations, which I guess is over the last two years, we started with the Skin Twenty as being the product we thought we'd aerosolize, and then kind of midstream, partway through, we actually we switched and and did it with the. The 45. So yeah, the product that is now aerosolized is at this stage just the one that is the carbon and mild and aluminum, which I say this carefully. By and large, is the biggest. It is the biggest um, demand is for those. I realize you, we can have corrosion issues on stainless and alloys as well, but in a in an 80% bell curve, this is definitely the one that that gets the most publicity, if you like, and requirement. Thanks. Great, great question, Dave. Uh, Gary, if you don't mind, Go for what right is ahead. the recommended mill thickness yep. that y'all recommend? Sure. So in the in the original TDS, it actually speaks about in in micron, and I'll give you the micron and mill. So 20 mil, 500 micron. Um, feedback from the field, and it's kind of become a bit of a a benchmark standard, is 10 mil DFT. So 250 micron. Okay. Um, has and and classically, you're going to get that. And again, I realize when you brush or when you spray, that can be, it's, it's all in the application, isn't it? But um, typically two to three generous coats will give you that, that 10 mil DFT thickness. 
Okay, thank you. And oftentimes in, in the in the industry, as I said earlier, a cross weave, so an application in one direction and the second coat in the opposite direction. Again, that doesn't always work because of whatever the item might be. But that is that's been a very um, successful the feedback has been that's been very successful. And two coats, which will often end up being slightly less than 10 mil, between eight and ten mil, it gives you enough of that banana skin integrity to grab it and pull it back. Good question. Thank you, Dave. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, another question from Kevin Donald. Can you cover painted surfaces? Yeah, that's 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 a that's a great question, Kev. Um, and welcome, welcome from Canada. Um, I'm going to say yes, you absolutely can. I mean, we we're part of the work that we're doing globally is in that space of mothballing of aircraft. So we we coat complete coated aircraft with with the product. And there's been some, I don't know if there's actually were were there any pictures on this presentation. There might not have been. But the answer is yes, and then the next word is however. Um, we would always encourage you strongly to, to trial it because certain coats, certain coatings, particularly if it's just a single part and, and a, a lower grade. Now, in this form, in the panel and in the attendees we have here today, typically we're talking high grade, two part, you know, heavy duty coatings. So again, I would say as a, as a generalized answer and Today, it's just a generalized adv advice is yes, you can apply it and yes, it will peel back. But we strongly recommend that a, a pilot quantity is trial just to ensure that it, it works in your application. We have, I remember years ago, we had application where it was used in a totally non-industrial, it was actually in a, um, a videography industry. So totally different to this forum. And they were using it to apply it and then they sprayed another coat on top so they could peel it back afterwards and return to the original color. And the coating that they applied the skin to was a cheap grade paint and the skin coating actually adhered. So again, totally different industry, totally misapplication we to even tell the story. But Kevin, in, in the space that you're playing in, you might say heavy industrial um, shell, absolutely don't foresee an issue but highly recommend doing a, a pilot trial, sir. Does that answer the question? Do you have any further questions there, Kev? Yeah, I think that answers it. Like, I think we talked before, so we have some rental equipment that we want to protect. We have to go into a tank and spray epoxy coating into the tank. And I don't, and we want to protect the scissor lifts and stuff like that, rental equipment uh, from overspray. So that's what yes. we were hoping to use this product for. So, you know, it should be a good quality paint that's being put on on Absolutely. that equipment. So I uh, just want to make sure we can paint it off. We don't want to yes. buy these scissor lifts at the end of the day. <laughs> and that's why we want to use something to protect them too, because they get quite expensive. You have to Absolutely. have to repaint them or whatever, right? So Yeah, no, big, big time. And, and what you say, again, yeah, please. Please, get Graham, be great. You're right. It's, um, you'll have no trouble with the scissor lifts, but as Gary points out, um, you should check. Um, the two areas where you'll have, have an issue is certain lacquers, which you're not going to see in, in corrosion control, are um, thermoplastics, and they melt with the solvents that are in, and so it, it can bind in. So there would be some furniture applications and possibly some other um, applications where someone may have used a coating that is um, um, hasn't been had its top coat applied. So if in an automotive environment where you're expecting to put a clear top coat over it, you have to be careful. But in essence, if the coating can resist a normal solvent wipe, It'll, the the peel this this the peelable coating will come straight off. It's the concern is if we've got a lacquer or something that's that's um dissolves in solvent, so it's not actually a proper coating that we would see used. I don't know if that makes sense, but any typical acrylic, epoxy, polyurethane, polysiloxane, you know, vinyl ester, polyester, anything like that, you have no trouble at all. Nitrocellulose lacquers is where we've had trouble, which okay. are furniture coatings. Right. Um, 
how about applying it to plastics? What do you it say there, fine. Yeah, Are absolutely UV, fine. UV resistance during storage? Yeah, absolutely fine. Absolutely. There, there, yeah. Again, there would be a the, the, the same um, disclaimer is there would be some plastics you couldn't apply to. I haven't. Uh, I don't know whether you can apply it to styrenes. Um, mm. I haven't looked into it. But it's your typical plastic that you would see used in any environmental, any machine that's going into any type of exterior environment is fine. It's where you mm. end up with um, items that are only for internal use that have got consumer type applications where you run into trouble. That's excellent. Thank you, Graham. That's, that's good, good input. Thank you, Kev. Does that does that answer at this stage? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Kev. Any further questions? Just conscious. I'm, I'm sorry we started late and thank you for everyone coming on. Are there any further questions before we wrap up and move to the last slide? Well, with that, um, we'd like to just, I guess, solicit if there are any further questions and I guess one of the, the actions from this is, would anyone like to do a trial? What we're offering as you might say, a move forward from here is if anyone would like to receive a free trial aerosol, if you can just message that in, just send a, a note to sales at skincoating.com and we'd be very happy to send an aerosol to you guys, um, whoever it is, just send your details and we'll send you a, a free trial of the Skin45 aerosol with a view to getting it specced in and, and buying truckloads which are sitting in the Houston warehouse ready to rock and roll. So there is stock just to confirm of the Skin 45 gallon buckets, the Skin 45 aerosols and the Skin 20 gallon buckets as well. So that stock is is ready, ready for shipping. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of, sh talking about stock, <laughs> what kind of shelf life do, does the product have? Yeah, that's a really good question. So you specifically asking about the aerosol or the, the gallon tin? Um, what is your both question? Of them? Both, yeah, really good question. Yeah. So um, in the in the gallon tins, what we have found is that there is not a specified shelf life prior to opening the tin. So prior to the gallon tin being opened, it will last for multiple years in storage. However, once it's opened, we would find typically, and again, if good housekeeping practices are, are applied and observed of closing the tin be between use, et cetera, you will get between six and 12 months. As far as the aerosol go goes, we do give that a 12 month shelf life. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate appreciate everyone's comments and, and input and, and certainly attention. It's been great. I trust everyone's learned and we look forward to being with you again and taking this forward. And if anyone again would like a, a sample aerosol, please message that in and our team will arrange that. Thanks. Thank you and good afternoon. To you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gary.